Any other questions before we move forward? Oftentimes, the spinal cord stem, um, the paddle placement for stem is um, usually around, for a low back, is usually around T7 to T9. Um, so just kind of thinking through. You can look through your, your whole neuroanatomical charts and your, uh, your uh, nerve distribution charts to see why in the world that's where we would typically have the, 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 the paddle leads placed. Um, so let's move forward. I don't know if you guys want the lights on or off. I don't really care. Something on. Oh, okay, on is fine. Okay, so assessment diagnosis. Um, in are you all learning assessment and diagnosis and physical exam with each of your systems as you go through? Okay. So the assessment of pain is a lot of talking and a lot of questions, but you're also doing the physical exam side as well. So it's really no different. And what you do when you're when you're managing or monitoring somebody with hypertension or diabetes or any other condition you're still asking a lot of questions and you're still doing targeted physical exam um, on whatever their complaint area is but you're also wanting to do at least um, uh, um, a uh, cardiovascular and pulmonary exam on these folks because why if you provide them opiates we know that opiates can be respiratory suppressing, and so we want to make sure that everything else is intact. So you just don't want to say, Miss Jones is here, you know, she's got OA of the knee, so I'm going to basically ask her a question about when did this start, how long have you treated it, what's been done, who did your surgery, what else has happened, okay, I'm going to examine the knee, and then I'm going to write you something and send you on your way. That happens a lot, but especially in the, on the chronic side, you want to make sure that you're reassessing on, on a routine basis everything that's going on with these folks. So understanding that we talked about that pain is, is, is multifactorial, multi-dimensional. Multi uh, we've got to not only deal with the quality, quantity, severity, the inciting, the insulting, um, how long has it gone on, what is your visual analog score like. You're also talking about sort of the psychology behind what's going on. Um, one thing, and we'll talk about this probably in the, the addiction side, um, in the sleep side as well, but I want to mention it now. I want you to kind of think about um, uh, what we call the pain triad or the pain triangle. And this is pain, mood, and sleep because all three of these components are absolutely necessary to be assessed and to be dealt with in any of your patients that have pain components. Why? Because if our pain is not well controlled, it's going to affect the way that our patients sleep. If our pain is not well controlled, it affects the psychological function of this patient. But independent and dependent on those, if we're not sleeping well, studies from the 1960s will show us that if I deprive somebody of enough rapid eye movement sleep, I can induce full psychotic behavior. So sleep is very important to mood, but sleep is where we what? We sort of recharge, right? We have a lot of healing that happens during that time. And so sleep is very important to dealing with acute and chronic pain. Now, from the mood side, if our mood is not well controlled, then our pain is worse, right? And if our mood is not well controlled, we have disrupted and fragmented sleep. So it's not uncommon, and you'll see this when we talk through the behavioral science side or whoever talks about um, mood disorders, um, that uh, it's very common, the classical symptom of someone who has a mood-related disorder may have an early morning awakening with complete difficulty or in returning to sleep. And so sleep is very vitally important when we look at, at the evaluation of, of mood. So pain, mood, and sleep, the whole little triangle is very, very important in, in looking at your assessment. So standard with everything else, history, physical exam, this may also involve other imaging or other techniques. So again, we talked about pain. We can't just do a blood test or we can't just do a scan or we can't just do some sort of, uh, of uh, a diagnostic test and say, ooh, this is what your pain level is and this is where it is. We can try to identify structural lesions or we can identify certain injuries that have happened through uh, electrodiagnostic testing or through scans and so forth to try to correlate symptomatology to 
what the scan shows us. So let's let's pretend somebody comes in again and they're complaining of centralized low back pain with a radicular component and says, well, you know what? It, it's, it starts in my back, but it wraps around the inside of my thigh and then it goes down, down my calf and, and, it, and it goes into these particular toes. Well, you can go and pull the dermatomal map up and you can say, wow, that's a distribution of this nerve. So now what do you do? You say, okay, well, I've tried some conservative things. We've tried some anti-inflammatory things. We're trying to deal with this, this whole transduction side. We've, we've had them use a little ice and we've engaged in some physical therapy and we might have used some, some um, uh, gabapentinoid medicine to try to reduce that nerve transmission, and we may have introduced something like a tramadol, and we're just not getting any better with all of these, these techniques. So now we say, well, let's investigate this a little further. So now what are we going to do? We may go and we may do some CAT scan or MRI. Um, now we're going to say, well, can we correlate the findings on that scan to the symptomatology. So hopefully we'll be able to say, okay, the scan is performed. Oh, well, here is an extruded disc pressing up against the nerve root on the left side of this particular of this particular area. Now, if you get a scan back and it says something completely different, then you've got to start figuring out. Why is the why is the, the structure not correlating to, to what the patient's telling you? It doesn't mean the patient's lying to you. It just may mean that whatever structurally is wrong on the scan doesn't necessarily mean it always manifests to your patient. So now you may start saying, okay, there's a discrepancy there. Now do I look at electrodiagnostic testing? Am I going to do EMG testing at the lower extremity to try to identify is this a, a peripheral neuropathy, is it some sort of other cutaneous issue, what is going on here? And so we may do EMG testing to look at that. So there are multiple, multiple components as you're working these folks up that are more involved than just sort of the questions, the exam, and then trying to figure out through other types of testing. Now, as you've probably heard a thousand times, and you're going to hear a million times more, most of your diagnosis is made by what? Yeah. We waste a lot of healthcare dollars doing a lot of stuff we don't really need to do. Patients like to waste healthcare dollars. They have insurance, they feel like they're entitled to know what's going on in there. I get asked probably 10 times a day, let's do a repeat scan of my back and I'll ask the patient, what is your plan going to be once we have that information? want to have a fifth surgery? Do you want to undergo interventional pain injections? Are we going to work something up further? No, I just want to know what's going on in there. The answer is no, I'm not going to spend the healthcare dollars just to know what's going on in there. If, if the patient is, the, if, the, if the treatment plan is, no matter what's going on in there, I'm going to absolutely refuse any other sort of intervention, whether it need to be surgically intervened with some sort of other interventional pain uh, uh, procedure. If they're saying no, all I want to know is has it changed from last time I did this? The answer is no, I'm not going to spend the healthcare dollars to do that. And if you lived in Canada, you wouldn't get to either. You don't know what the wait list is for an elective MRI? Seven to 10 years. So if you're playing soccer and you tear up your knee at the local indoor soccer place and you're in Canada as a Canadian citizen and you say, man, I want to I wanna get an MRI on this knee, they'll say it's a non-life-threatening condition and we as the Canadian government don't feel like we need to spend the dollars on that, so get in line. And maybe in seven to ten years you can have that elective scan. And then if you want an elective surgery, because it's non-life-threatening, we'll put you in line for that too, but you might as well just go to the U.S. and have them take care of that. They don't waste the healthcare dollars there either. So pain history, you're using your little mnemonic. I'm not big on mnemonics, but this is, you know, it, however you can remember things is, I'm sure you used a mnemonic when you went through the cranial nerves, right? 
Is there any cranial nerve mnemonic that doesn't have some sort of dirty something in it? No, there's no mnemonic for the cranial nerves that has that doesn't have some sort of inappropriate something in it. At least not mine. And I still remember it to this day. So, mnemonic. This one's clean. So, quality, impact, size, severity, temporal characteristics, aggravating, alleviating factors, past responses. What's the patient expectation? That's one of the most important things. Setting the correct goals, and then your physical exam. Treatment. We sort of talked about <coughs> we talked about treatments. So this is anything from dealing with the psychological side to non-medication interventions to surgical interventions to to uh, interventional pain injections to opioids to non-opioid related therapies. Um, but the most important thing is identifying proper goals. What's the expectation? So in every new patient that we see um, on our intake paperwork, we ask them specifically, what is their worst pain been in the past month? What is their least pain been in the past month? What is their average pain in the past month? What is their current pain? And what is their expectation of my treatment? What is their goal? If you have somebody that presents with chronic debilitating pain that's been there for a number of years because nobody gets to my side until they've been through a lot of other people they've seen a lot of people much smarter than me before they get to me they've seen the surgeons and they've seen physical therapy and they've seen physical medicine and rehab they've had all kinds of other interventions before they get to me somebody's had pain for 10 years and they tell me that their expectation is a pain level of zero we've got a we've got a long road ahead of us because we've got to set that right expectation. If we look at most of the clinical trial work, and I'm not a big clinical trial data believer, clinical trial work is mainly looking at safety. Um, the data really poorly extrapolates out to the real world. Um, but if we look at sort of how do we quantify effective treatment, anywhere between 30 and 50 percent pain reduction is considered effective. So if somebody comes in and they're moved from an acute to a chronic, now this is more chronic. If somebody's got an acute pain injury, it's okay if our expectation is a pain of a zero. But if we're six months in and we still got a pain level of an eight and I want a pain of a zero, we're now starting to shoot for a more appropriate reduction and that may be we may have to live with a pain level of four, and if we can get a 50% reduction over time, that's probably a, a, a pretty good goal. So setting the right expectation is good. So we talked about acute pain treatments, chronic pain goals, um, it's not gonna go to zero. You've gotta have the right expectation and set the right expectation with folks. I mentioned multiple modalities, so we're not only dealing with systemic medications or top, topical medications or opioid or non-opioid medicines, this is other things such as physical therapy, acupuncture. Um, we send a lot of folks for acupuncture. I refer consistently for tragus piercings for chronic headache folks. Um, not that I go into tattoo places, uh, but 23rd Street actually has one of the few people in the state that is trained properly in tragus piercing for reduction in chronic headaches. And uh, so oftentimes I'll send folks for acupressure and acupuncture that have chronic recurrent headaches. And if they get good relief with acupressure at the tragus, we'll have them have tragus piercings done. And 23rd Street actually does a good job with that. Chiropractic therapy, interventional pain. We've talked about intrathecal and spinal cord stem stuff. Acute on chronic, so we can still have acute exacerbations of pain. So just because somebody's pain may be fairly well controlled with chronic use of um, oral or topical systemic medication, doesn't mean they can't still have an acute injury or ac acute pain on top of the chronic pain. Um, so the expectation isn't necessarily, I've treated your pain and you're on some sort of medication to help get your pain level down to a two, that doesn't mean that you're not going to be able to feel pain. We're still going to be able to transduce, transmit, up, back down the pathway, and perceive 
pain, even if we've been provided some intervention for whatever the chronic underlying condition is. If we re-injure that area or injure another area, the system is still set up and still designed to be able to send those signals so that why? We want to help preserve the species, okay? So breakthrough pain, um, this is a, a topic that in the chronic pain world, there's about half folks that say, I believe in, in treating what's known as breakthrough pain, and the other half of folks says, no, I don't believe in that whatsoever. But breakthrough pain can really be classified in a couple of different ways. And this is um, that we've got pain well controlled, but a, a particular incident brings that pain back on, or that we've got end of life or end of, not end of life, person-wise, but end of life drug-wise failure. Um, so we have a, a return in pain because the half-life of the drug is gone before it's time for us to redose. So uh, if we think about um, fentanyl, uh, transdermally applied fentanyl, um, the patch is approved by the FDA for every 72 or, if you read the package insert, every 48 hour changes, Q72 or Q48. Most insurances want you to change Q72. There's about 50% of patients that will tell you that they've got end of dose. They, they don't say, I've got end of dose failure, but they come in and describe to you that day of patch change, I'm really hurting. I changed my patch. Within a few hours, I'm starting to do better. Day after my patch change, I'm okay. Day number three, I'm starting to really tail off. And this is classic end of dose failures. So they start having breakthrough pain because of end of dose failure. Treatment planning, this is you setting the right expectations and educating your patients. Why are we treating your pain? What is the goal of treating this pain? When are we going to reevaluate how effective this pain treatment is? And if it's ineffective, what is our next step? So with these patients, whether they be acute or chronic, you want to set those milestones so that patients have a proper expectation. You don't want to leave it nebulous. It's not the, uh, it, it's really tough when patients have um, a, a surgical intervention and they're still really uncomfortable at the six month mark and they go back in and the surgeon tells them, well, it could be up to a year. Well, you told me in the beginning it could be up to six months and now it's up to a year. And they just sort of have this nebulous, never ending of, I don't know what to expect. Um, I think some of the surgeons that do the best job are orthopedic when it comes to knees and hips because they have the, the whole dummy's manual to this is what to expect at every step of the way. And so it sets the, 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 the right expectation up for patients so that they know what to expect. And if something is, is out of line, then they can discuss that, reformulate a plan, and get back on track. Other areas of medicine, though, you see sort of nebulous plans or no plan whatsoever, so patients don't really know what the expectation is. They don't know what is my goal, and once we've reached this particular goal, what is the next step? And we're, are, we, are we going towards resolution of symptomatology in acute patients, or what is our goal for, dose re, or, or for, uh, for pain level reduction? in our chronic patients, what are our goals for improved function and quality of life? So in chronic patients especially, I don't let them say, I want to get to a pain level of X. I make them tell me, what is it that you want to be able to do from a function standpoint? So Thursdays in our clinic are intrathecal pump day. It's when we refill and adjust intrathecal medications. So that was yesterday. Um, I've got a gentleman that he, he, he um, is very anxious. He perseverates on his pain. He'll bring you in um, a, a calendar six times a day. My pain is, my pain is, my pain is, my pain is. And um, he's been a very difficult patient to treat. And, and so I asked him yesterday, I said, I want, you know, I told him last time, a month ago, I said, 
quit concentrating on this number. I want you to tell me what it is that you want to be able to do. What am I dosing this medicine for? And he finally was able, he spent the last month thinking about that. He was finally able, and he came in, and he sat down with me, and his, his wife was there with him. He said, I thought a lot about what you said last month, about this looking at this number and wanting my number to be whatever. And he said, I'm no longer doing that. I figured out what I want to do. And I said, well, what is that? He said, I want to be able to sit through a movie with my wife or go to dinner or be able to do some light grocery shopping. I said, we finally made progress three years later. Okay? So sometimes it takes a while, but proper goal setting is what these patients need. And they have to realize if we don't reach that goal, we're going to set a new one or at that goal, we've got a decision that we're going to make and that's either dose reduction or if we need to change something, we've already talked with them about what that change might be so that they can do a little research on their own. Unfortunately, they all have access to the internet. Whatever's on the internet is 100% true in their minds. So you want to give them the ability to do a little personal research so then that you can educate them correctly, dispel the rumors, encourage them to continue to become champions of their own diseases and, and, and they've got to become experts. What do we teach diabetic patients? You have got to become the expert of your own body and your own diabetes. You've got to take control of this. I can't do it. I tell all of my patients that I've got on positive airway pressure for treatment of their obstructive or central apnea. I can educate you all day long, I can order the device, I can do everything possible, but I can't crawl in bed with you at night and put this thing on. So we've got to educate them, set the right goals, set the right expectations, but they've got to buy in and they've got to want to get better. So when we're choosing drug, especially analgesic drug, the five R's, this one's really, really important. Right analgesic, dose, route of administration, interval, and right expectations. Interventional pain, we talked about that. We talked about, uh, there are multiple different types of injections. There are blocks and ablations and rhizotomies and implanted devices and so forth. Um, as you get out into your careers, you'll make relationships with interventional folks that are um, going to be vitally important. We, we, we use interventional providers all across the state um, to help augment what we do through um, use of uh, oral and topical uh, systemic medicines. Treatment course, that's really about your goals. How long are we going to treat this particular condition? And what is my goal? And when am I going to reevaluate that goal? Part of, especially if you're using controlled substances, is that you need to have a reevaluation schedule. And you've got to be able to document what is the improvement in quality of life with this patient. So if somebody is on oral systemic opiate medication and they're at maximum dose based on the CDC opioid treatment guidelines and they come in every single month and tell you I'm absolutely miserable, my pain is a 10, I can't get out of bed, I've got no quality of life, all I do is sit in bed all day long. You've got to decide is your treatment providing any benefit? And if not, you've got to have a difficult decision to make and discussion with the patient of maybe this isn't the right treatment for you. Now is it that you rotate to a different opiate? Do you look at doing <coughs> some other intervention? What are your other treatment options and then setting the right goal? But if there's no goal set and it's just that I'm going to muddle through life and you're going to come in and you're going to get your same dose of medicine every month and you're going to tell me you're a 10 and you're going to go back and say you lay in bed all day long and you're going to come back next time and we're going to do the whole thing again, you're really not defining any treatment course, you're not defining any expectation and really you're doing a disservice to the patient and ultimately if you're not reevaluating the effectiveness of your treatment, you're doing a disservice to, to patient and your own practice of medicine because you're really not you're not doing a whole lot. Treatment end. Either A, if the pain is resolved, B, if you if you have the ability to make dose reductions or changes in, in treatment options to, to lesser as you've improved, or if somebody's no longer an appropriate candidate, abuse, misuse, diversion. And we'll talk about that whenever 
to do the next lecture in July the 13th. I think it's Friday the 13th. So, uh, Referral to specialist. Uh, most commonly, your pain folks are going to start either in primary care or in surgical subspecialties. And um, uh, oftentimes, uh, general practice and surgical subspecialties are okay with trying to get through the post-operative course. Um, early chronic course, but if it persists beyond, you know, say three up to six months, now it's looking at maybe we need to get somebody else involved. Um, the, uh, although the CDC guidelines were initially uh, put into place for general practitioners, insurances, the federal government, the state government has latched on to those guidelines and applied them across the board even to pain subspecialty. So the referral to specialists is even more important that um, you as general practitioners or in surgical subspecialty or in any other aspect of medicine really have to decide, am I adequately trained? Am I documenting everything that the state requires me to document? Have I reviewed all of the necessary things that your narcotics prescription monitoring reports? Am I documenting all of the treatment goals and options and so forth? Am I able to do that in my day-to-day -day activity of treating hypertension and diabetes and now chronic pain on top of that? Or should I go ahead and get the subspecialists involved that that's all they do all day long? Because it's getting more and more difficult for jacks of all trades to be able to meet all of this strenuous requirements that are required by the state and the federal bodies to deal with treatment of chronic pain, especially when you're dealing with opiates. Regulatory folks, state of Oklahoma, if you're going to write controlled substances, you've got to have an active DEA license, an active license in the state of Oklahoma, and an open Bureau of Narcotics license that's unrestricted. <laughs> Responsible opioid prescribing. So all of these things are set forth by the state and by <coughs> the uh, federal regulatory bodies that each one of these things is an absolute necessity to either possess or to document when you're taking care of folks, um, especially if you're going to prescribe opioid medications. Uh, so this, you've got this in your handout. I don't have to go through all of this, but just know that if you're going to if you're going to go down the road of treating somebody with opiate medications, there's lots of hoops to jump through and make sure that you're. Documenting, 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 documenting. CDC guidelines, I went through that. Was anybody not in here whenever we talked through CDC guidelines, kind of when I was passing the pump and all that stuff around, how they got through those guidelines, what the basis of those guidelines are from a milligram perspective and so forth. Uh, the State Bureau of Narcotics, um, so it's a requirement in the state of Oklahoma that if you're going to prescribe controlled substances that you check the prescription monitoring program. Um, the state uh, has a wonderful little tool that I don't necessarily agree with their math all of the time, but there's a, a bar graph for every patient um, in the prescription monitoring program that calculates um, morphine equivalency um, on their current doses of medicine. So each time you pull a patient up, you're going to see not only who wrote their medicine and what their medicine is and what the dose is and dosing frequency or based on the number of tablets that they received, and where they filled that at the pharmacy, there's also a graph that is constantly looking at. And now the state also has returned to, they got rid of this at one point, and they're back to flagging charts in patients who are on more than 100 milligram morphine equivalent, patients who are on combination of opiates with benzodiazepines, and patients who are on combination of opiates with carisoprodol or soma. I'm going to tell you, I hope that nobody in this room writes what's known as the Holy Trinity. Okay, don't do it. I don't ever want to see it. That's a combination of benzodiazepines, opiates, and carisoprodol, soma. Don't let patients talk you into writing soma. I will tell you right now, I absolutely despise that medicine. It's a terrible muscle relaxant. It doesn't work worth 10 cents. It taps into the pleasure part of the brain. They think that they're getting some sort of relief because they're getting some mild euphoria. Don't write it most common cause of unintentional overdose death based on the state of Texas medical examiner's report five years ago was hydrocodone 
with song. Don't write it. Okay? Benzodiazepines. The FDA came out with black box warning a few years ago. Opiates with benzodiazepines is no longer considered acceptable medical practice. Don't do it. I'm going to suggest that you don't write benzos at all, but in some cases they're absolutely necessary. I'm going to agree with alcohol withdrawal or uncontrolled seizures, but beyond that, benzos are in a don't do that. <coughs> Benzodiazepines will just get you in trouble over time. Why are they dangerous? It's the respiratory suppressing effect. So what we'll talk about in sleep on the great Friday the 13th, you have the reticular activating system in your brain stem. You are under somewhat voluntary control of your breathing during waking times, during conscious wake times. You can take a deep breath in and hold it for several minutes. You can breathe more quickly. Um, but during sleep, you are not under conscious control of your breathing. So the reticular activating system is constantly monitoring for carbon dioxide metabolism. So you have a set of receptors called chemoreceptors in the arch of the aorta and in the brain stem. These are looking at carbon dioxide tension in the blood. So if you're on jeopardy or if you're just out in medicine and somebody asks you what is the drive to breathe, please don't say oxygen. It's the metabolism <laughs> of carbon dioxide. So these chemoreceptors are looking at that, but your brain stem, the reticular activating system, is what is inducing that respiratory system to say breathe, breathe, breathe. This system is highly susceptible to the effects of benzodiazepines, opiates, alcohol, or if somebody's had stroke, or to the surgery in the arch of the aorta. So those medications suppress the respiratory drive, putting us at greater risk of respiratory suppression and then sudden cardiac death. So the holy trinity, benzodiazepines, opiates, carisoprolol, don't write them. The FDA has gone far enough to start looking into gabapentinoids, BZRAs, benzodiazepine receptor drugs for sleep, Ambien, Lunesta, Sonata, so Zolpidem, Zalapon, um, uh, Zopaclone for your generics that you gotta learn. So there are warnings now coming out through insurance companies as well looking at gabapentinoids, BZRAs, combining those with opiates. So you now have the CDC guidelines that said for general practitioners, if you're going to use beyond 90 milligram morphine equivalent, really needs to go see the pain guys. The state, legis uh, the state regulatory bodies, the insurance companies have latched on. Now they've put that across the board, even pain subspecialties being beat up about more than 90 milligram morphine equivalent. Now insurances are sending warnings, refusing to pay for medicines beyond that, sending warnings regarding combination of benzodiazepines and opiates. Please know the FDA placed that black box warning on benzodiazepines and opiates and do not do it. Opioid prescribing state of Oklahoma. Um, Dr. McNeil was uh, on the panel of folks that dealt with this particular thing, and this is the opioid treatment guidelines for office-based care, as well as emergency department and urgent care. Um, it's a set of guidelines that if you're going to treat patients' pain, whether it be in an urgent care, primary care, chronic pain setting, these are something that you need to read and read and read again. And it's a lot of the things we talked about already. Um, opiate prescribing in Oklahoma, this is the, the bill that made it mandatory for checking the PMP that we mentioned earlier. Document, 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 document. Addiction versus tolerance. Addiction is a pathophysiological process. So this is, I got all my medicine and I took it all in a few days, or I'm borrowing it from other folks, or I'm buying it off the street, or I'm stealing it from other people. That's different from tolerance dependence. Tolerance is the body has seen the drug over time. We're going to get a, a, a receptor upregulation. So I've provided drug. I had this many receptors. This drug dealt with those receptors. Now I get an upregulation. I've got more receptors. It requires more drug. So I've built up a tolerance. Now if I remove the drug abruptly, I'm physically dependent, so I'm going to have adverse effects from that. Dependence and tolerance don't mean somebody has an addiction, nor does it mean that they've got some other pathology going on because we can be dependent and tolerant on antihypertensive agents. I provide somebody clonidine, 
I take it away, we're going to have a rebound hypertensive effect. They can be dependent on their blood pressure medicines. They can be dependent on their psychiatric medicines. We can have an acute withdrawal from uh, abrupt discontinuation of uh, 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 serotonergic agents. We can have seizures that are induced by abrupt withdrawal of benzodiazepines. So just because somebody has dependence or tolerance doesn't mean that they've got an issue with addiction. I don't need to read that. Questions? Actually, let's talk about state question 788. Who's got questions about that? I'm going to stay politically neutral, I think. Is that the marijuana one? That is. If you guys get a, a decide to dispense for the medical, are you going to continue to prescribe opiates as well? So or are you going to say, if you get a marijuana card, you're not going to have any opiates? To this point, that has been our stance, is that um, there, there is, there, in my opinion, beyond childhood seizure disorders, there is not a lot of great evidence for the use of marijuana in other medical conditions. And most of the evidence is there deals with cannabinoids. So we have endogenous cannabinoid receptors in the spinal canal and in the brain. Why do we need the THC component? We don't. We need the cannabinoid side. State question 788. I do think that cannabinoids can be beneficial in some conditions. We need a lot more research to know what those are. The bill, the way it is written, is the problem. There are no limitations on what conditions can or cannot be used or in, in what capacity it can or it cannot be used. Unfortunately, our state did a very poor job at looking at our neighbor to the west. The state of Colorado is now a little over their five-year mark for recreational use. The Colorado Springs Gazette put out a set of statistics in December of last year the one most striking that I think should have been on every billboard across the state was fatal car accidents are up 50% in five years in the state of Colorado because of impaired driving. 50%. The state of Colorado is spending 75% of its tax revenue on emergency room visits for overdose and treatment of use in those under the age of 18. There was a study that came out on Valentine's Day this year by a pro-cannabis researcher who was looking specifically at is there synergistic effect between the use of opiates combined with THC. So these were patients who were currently on oxycodone which oxycodone is one of the more highly abused, misused, and diverted drugs onto the street. So you had patients who were treated with oxycodone and they added THC to one group, they added placebo to one group, and the other group just stayed on oxycodone. The study was designed hoping that the THC plus oxycodone would show a statistically significant improvement in pain scale scores and improvement in function and quality of life. The only statistically significant finding in that study, oxycodone misuse went up 33% in the THC group. And it was unchanged in the placebo group. So, Although cannabinoids can probably be of benefit, the bill that's written right now in front of us has no regulation in place. The State Health Department is not ready to deal with it. We're going to have to go into special legislative session to deal with it because the bill as it's written has a 30-day start window once it passes. So I just caution you to do your own research. So the question of will we write it, we're going to have to cross that bridge when it happens. Have you seen the CBD oil be beneficial 
So I've had hundreds of patients try CBD oil. Um, and I will tell you that with no firm numbers, but I'm going to say it's in an upward of 95% of patients come back to me and say, my pocketbook is a lot lighter because it's super expensive. I've noticed no change in my pain and I might sleep a little better and my anxiety might be a little less. So we do know that cannabinoids can have a very prominent effect on mood and sleep, um, but I've not seen a significant improvement, whether it be topically or, and that's just anecdotally. We don't, we don't um, dispense it from our clinic. There are a number of, actually you can probably go just about anywhere in the city. I mean, even the lady I get my hair cut by, they've got it on the counter. I mean, it's ubiquitous, um, but patients who are in the chronic realm with us, the majority of them have not gotten a lot of benefit. Um, where is your stance on UAs? Pain. Yeah, we didn't have time to go through that, but um, I, I am a huge I'm a huge proponent for urine drug screening and testing. It's the only definitive method that you have as a clinician to know that the patient is taking the medication that you've provided them, that they're not taking other controlled substances that have not been prescribed to them, and that they're not using any illicit substances. I'm not a fan of immunoassay testing because there are so many interactions that can happen in false positives. So in our clinic, we only use liquid chromatography and dual mass spectrometry testing. Um, so we do screen first pass through LCMS, and if we confirm it's a second pass through LCMS, we don't use immunoassay testing. I have a second question. Yes. Um, so I worked at a pharmacy, and there was a lot of um, husband-wife duos on the same exact medication, same dose. Yes, we, we in our clinic have a policy that we do not take husbands, wives, or first, first degree family members. Okay. Because if somebody gets in trouble, we had to fire both of them. And we used to have a few family members that we would see. It's, it's ubiquitous, the sharing of medicine in families. Once you get into especially chronic pain and you start asking patients, their uncles, brothers, sisters, dogs, cats. It's amazing. Chronic pain patients, you look on their OBN and there's a little doggy next to when doggy gets tramadol or phenobarbital or whatever, um, and that their doggy's on medicine as well. And so is part of it just that that uh, chronic pain runs in families, or is it that the taboo for the use of, of opioids or benzodiazepines and so forth has been removed from those families and so they're more willing to treat that? I don't know. But it's very common that you see pain run in families or the use of medications for the treatment pain conditions, runs, and things. Other questions? Concerns? Okay. You've had two hours of me, and now you get two hours more. Who's got my other toys? Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Does he need to take a break? You can. Yeah, take a break. Don't worry, I won't take a full